Opening take three. United States Steel Hour from New York. Now, Cliff Robertson stars in Man on the Mountaintop, a drama of explosive emotions co starring Paul McGrath and Salome Jens. sing. I'm an actor. I know, Charlie told me. Well, now you're not singing. Come on, let's sing. I'll teach you how to project. I'm very good at projecting. Willie, you're going to scare her. Like a lot of chance. Like, I'm going to show her how to become like beat in one easy lesson. Yeah, well, meantime, we're out of beer, so would you mind going down to the delicatessen and getting us some beer? All right, sure, you come with me. This is your chance. Your big chance to see the village after midnight. You can write home in the morning to the folks in Iowa that you did the whole thing. <laughs> Uh, uh, wait a minute, have you got any money? Oh, no, I haven't, but I'll go back and get my... Never first. mind, I'll get it from your brother. Horace. Horace, I know you're in there. Go away. Horace, I've got to talk to you. I don't want to talk. It's about that position Dr. Wilson offered. Horace, you must listen to me, do you understand? Now look, Horace, I, I, I'm trying to be reasonable, but I'm not going to try to tell you anything if you, if you won't even see me or, or, or answer my letters. Go away! Horace, haven't you had enough of this? Isn't it about time you came to your senses? There comes a point... Go away! ...when I feel that you are being completely foolish about this whole thing. Now look, Horace, I'm telling you. Don't tell me anything. Go away or I'll kill you, do you hear me? I'll kill you! That impoverished mom. Willie, come on. Who's that? Who lives in there? Oh, in there? Oh, that's the genius, you know. The genius? Oh, yeah, the, the prodigy. Horace Mann Borden, a great prodigy. <laughs> Some prodigy, that creep. Come on, let's get the beer. Trouble with your brother, Charlie. He's a member of the What Is It School of Painting. Can you look at you say, what is it? Willie, we've been gone almost an hour. He's a painter who thinks, you know. He paints the inner man. If I want to know what the inner man looks like, I go to a doctor. I get an x-ray. Cows. He ought to Willie, paint cows, go back. trees, an occasional flower pot, and you ought to agree with me because you're from Iowa. Well, wouldn't you rather see a cow hanging on a wall than a what is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think too much. You never say anything. I think we ought to go back. The beer's getting warm. Don't you know it's dangerous to think too much? Look at that genius there, the prodigy. You see what happens when you think? Shh, Willie, he'll no, hear you. He doesn't mind. 
No, you mind, Prodigy? See, he doesn't say anything. He lives in a world of his own, a dark, creepy world full of dark thoughts. Willie, please, let's go. Look, if we went right back, your sister-in-law would faint. When you beat, you gotta, you gotta do things inconsistently. That's what makes character. Prodigy, clean up the coffee cups, will you? That's a good prodigy. If you ever wanted to know what a prodigy looked like, Gerda, that's, that's a prodigy. That's a real prodigy. See what happens when you have brains and you think too much? You work in a crummy cafeteria. Prodigy, say hello to your neighbor. Well, they don't. Wait, I, I'll show you. I'll get an idea. Pr a prodigy, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. 50 cents if you give the answer to the following question within three seconds. Gerda, listen to this. This is the way he makes his movie money because this prodigy goes to two or three movies a day. All right, you ready, Horace Mann? Give me the answer in three seconds. What is 578 times 309? 178,602. Just a minute, I'll check it. 28 and carry the two. Right. Absolutely right. Fabulous. Isn't it fabulous, Gerda? That's what you can do when you think. Let's take the beer back. Good night, genius. Come on, Gerda. No, please, don't touch me. Gerda, baby, what did I do? You're a monster. A vicious, horrible little monster. I'll take the beer back. I told you, you think too much. I want to apologize. Please don't think that... I mean, that was a terrible thing he just did. And since we're going to be neighbors, you see, I'm going to live with Charlie and Betty. I think I ought to introduce myself. My name is Goethe. Goethe Blake. Don't cry. Please don't cry. You must let me alone. You must let me alone. Let's get some air in here. Yeah, the party's over, all right. What happened to you? Willie came back over an hour ago. I figured maybe first day in New York, you got lost. I was sitting in Washington Square. I didn't feel like coming right back. Charlie, what? I met the strangest man, the saddest man I've ever met. Oh, brother, who? He lives next door. His name is Borden, Horace Mann Borden. What, that flip? Oh. Charlie. <laughs> well, that's what he is. He's a real flip. Oh, I know all about him. What do you know? Oh, he was famous. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't remember. His father had some kind of theory about kids being able to learn. And like by the age of three months, this kid was building with blocks. And by three years, he could read, he could translate Greek. He memorized the complete works of Shakespeare. Oh, you know, he graduated from college when he was 12. No wonder he's so lonely. Hey, are you? Now, now, listen, Goethe, don't start feeling sorry for this character. He's... Well, he's gone, you know what I mean? What a waste. What a terrible waste. Oh, look, Betty, will you talk to this girl? This is the girl who brought home the stray cat. This is the compassionate member of the family. So? I thought that's why she was your favorite sister. Uh, hi. Charlie, leave him alone. I'm going to ask him in for a coffee. Charlie. Hey, how'd you like to join us for coffee? Charlie, don't care. He's scared. Scared? What's he got to be scared of? Look, well, people have called me a genius too, you know. Charlie, you're as bad as Willie. Oh, here. Do you want these? My, how many are there? Oh, Sunset Boulevard. Isn't this from Sunset Boulevard? Well, sure it is. There's William Holden in that scene with Gloria Swanson in her bedroom. You know, I think he's one of my favorite actors. Uh, do you collect them? Yes. May I have them, please? Well, where do you get them? These, some of these are from very old pictures. Secondhand stores and uh, movie houses. Why are you afraid of people? Are you afraid of me? Shouldn't you get to know someone before you decide whether to be afraid of them or not? People make fun of you, don't they? Like that terrible Willie, and 
They get angry with you like my brother Charlie. Do you have a cigarette? No. Oh. Well, I don't smoke anyway, not as a general rule. Just every once in a while to be sociable. Well, there are your pictures. Good night. Good night. After I got of college this spring, Mum and Dad wanted me to stay in Iowa and start teaching right away, but I didn't think I wanted that. So a couple girlfriends and I decided to take a crazy tour of Europe, where all we did was get on and off buses. And when I was in Europe, I decided that maybe I'd study in New York for a while, take a couple of teacher's courses at Columbia, you know. Maybe even teach in New York for a while. And then Charlie said that I could stay with him and Betty until I found a place of my own. I have two other brothers and two sisters, but I'm the youngest. Are you an only child, Horace? Please don't call me that. Well, what should I call you? I've got to call you something if we're going to talk, if we're going to be friends. Borden. Borden. Well, are you an only child? Don't you know about me? No. If you want to know about me, you can read about me in books. Go to the library, look under the card. Borden, Horace Mann, cross-reference, child prodigy. <laughs> You're laughing. Oh, no. I was just thinking I never knew anyone before who was a subject of books. That must mean that you're very important. And now you're laughing at me. I find it inconceivable that anyone could be so naive. Important, I'm not important. I don't want to be important. I will tell you something. I stand here talking to you and listening to you talk, and I ask myself why. I ask myself that question because I have learned I must do without people. That's a terrible decision. It's the least painful, take my word for that. But why? Knowing people, being friendly with people, liking people, how can that be painful? Nineteen years ago, when I was 12, I graduated from the university, summa cum laude, and I was asked to deliver my honor thesis before the combined physics staffs of Harvard and MIT. The subject of my papers was Einstein's theory of the expanding universe, its meaning and application. Do you understand what I've just said? Do you understand the implication of what I've just told you? It means that I am a freak, a freak and a monster. A freak and a monster cannot live in this world of normal people. for the coffee. It's all right. I didn't have to pay for it. Oh, I didn't mean that. Will we talk again some other time? Why? Does there have to be a reason? There's another book you should read. It's not about me, but I think you should read it. Philip Wiley wrote it, and it's about a doctor who has a serum, a Superman serum. And he injected it into his newborn child, his son, as an experiment. And sure enough, the son grew up to be a Superman. The serum was good, but there was one problem. The world, this world we live in, is too small and too narrow for a Superman. People are afraid of Superman, just as they are afraid of monsters. 
Being a Superman is a beautiful fantasy for the tormented and tortured little people, but those same little people can't stand it when the Superman comes along. In this world, that Superman is crucified. Is that what happened to the Superman in Wiley's book? That poor creature ended up on a mountaintop, shouting his defiance at God until lightning came from the sky and destroyed him. Reduced him to nothing, absolutely nothing. Must be a very sad story. It's a true story. But what was there for people to fear? Why must everyone be afraid? Don't you see? No. Last night I was looking through the collection of my photographs and I came across some pictures of William Holden. You said that you liked him. Would you like to come in and, uh, and look at them? This is the United States Steel Hour, and now, George Hicks. Something big is happening these days here in Seattle, Washington, the beautiful key city of America's great and fast-growing Northwest. Yes, this progressive metropolis is busy preparing for the 1962 Seattle World's Fair, the Century 21 Exposition, first American World's Fair in more than 20 years. Thousands of men are already at work constructing this spectacular international show and creating 74 acres of buildings and displays dedicated to man in the space age. One of the many unique features of the fair will be an advanced Swedish monorail system that will carry 10,000 people an hour from the heart of Seattle to the fair in just one and a half minutes. The Coliseum, including an incredible floating city, will house the theme exhibits showing man's life to be in the space age. This beautiful glass-walled building will be a permanent structure and the heart of a new Seattle Civic Center after the fair. One of the major attractions will be the United States government's science exhibit, a great six-building pavilion that will preview scientific marvels of the 21st century. United States Steel's exhibit will be housed here. Other buildings will contain exhibits from more than 30 nations and many American firms. But the real symbol of this fair is the Space Needle, rapidly rising towards its full height of 600 feet. This soaring structure will be topped by a revolving restaurant where diners and visitors will see a panoramic view of Puget Sound, the Olympic Mountains, the Cascades, and beautiful Mount Rainier. The Space Needle is being fabricated and constructed by the Pacific Car and Foundry Company from a new structural steel made by United States Steel called A36. These huge columns weigh 1,000 pounds per foot, but even so, this new steel has lighter weight and greater strength that make it an important advance for major construction projects. As the Space Needle rises and the work continues, the thoughts of practically all Seattle are on April 21st, 1962, opening day, when the Seattle World's Fair will be a magnificent reality. The fair will run for six months. United States Steel joins with the people of Seattle and the Northwest in the hope that you and your family will be among the millions who will come to the fair. We return to Act Two of Man on a Mountaintop from New York. Now, oh, the thing is, Willie, she's been seeing this guy every day for the last couple of weeks. That's the thing that can lead nowhere. And you gotta help. So what can I do if she doesn't like me? No more green hair. Oh, come on, Willie. What happened to the ego? I thought all the girls liked you. Only in a rod of way. His sister of yours is way down the scale. See, the more they think, the less they like me. And this one's a regular Rodin statue. She thinks so much, she hates me. Well, then be charming, huh? 
for a lovely lady. <laughs> Thank you, Willie, <laughs> but put them back in the glass. Charlie, tell Betty I'll be back to make supper. Uh, where are you going? I'm going to meet Borden at the movies. Oh, you could go blind from seeing so many movies. No, Willie, this is the stray cat bit. This is the real stray cat bit. Charlie, you've got to understand, no one ever cared for this man. Yes, he goes to two, three movies a day. Do you know why? Just to hear the sound of people's voices. So you're on a mission? No, I'm on a mission. I happen to like him. But why? why? What does he do for you? What does this guy satisfy in you that you've got to knock yourself out like this? Hmm? I don't. Oh, go to the theater with Willie tonight. He wants to take you. Live actors, real live actors. Thump, thump, thump. I'm sorry, I'm busy. You want to change him, don't you, Gerda? Well, look out, little sister, because you're playing with dynamite. Now, let him alone. Tell Betty I'll be back. And, Charlie, thank you for your concern, but I do know exactly what I'm doing. Sick. Very sick. Oh, shut up. What's with the green man? Oh, shut up. If you're looking for Mr. Borden, he isn't home. Oh? He's at work. I just left him. Oh, you're, you're a friend of his, of course. Yes, I've seen you together. Sometimes standing across the street, I've, uh, I've seen you. You're his father. Yes. Oh, please don't run for me, please. But I really no, I must. To. I must talk to you. I must talk to someone who, who knows my son and who, who likes him. You look like a fair-minded young woman, Miss... Uh, Blake. Miss Blake. 20 minutes. Well, five minutes, please. All right, Dr. Borden, come in. My brother and his wife will be back shortly. I have to prepare dinner. Just five minutes. Please go on with whatever it is you have to do. I don't know if Borden Horace would approve of our meeting like this. Then he has spoken to you of me? No, I read the books. You see me as a villain. I suppose you did what you thought was right. I was right, Miss Blake, I was. Oh, he was an astonishing child, a true marvel. But I still maintain that in general practice, any child, given, given the right uh, chap. Oh, but you, uh, you were not good enough to give me five minutes of your time to listen to my theory. Miss, may I please? Yes, of course. Thanks. Miss Blake, I need your help. Somewhere along the line, somewhere in the relationship between my son and me, something went wrong. Six years ago, he rejected me and everything in his life. The man began living like, uh, like this. Perhaps it's the way he wants to live, Dr. Borden. No, I can't believe that. I won't believe it. And you can't believe that either. Not for my son. I live here. My brother and his wife live no, here. No, no, you're rationalizing, Miss Blake. For you, for your brother, he's an artist, isn't he? It's perfectly proper, perhaps even necessary, but not for my son. Not for Horace Borden, who could be the Einstein of his generation. Can you imagine the marvel of two such minds in one century? The waste, the terrible, terrible waste. Miss Blake, there is a position at Columbia University. They, they want him. Now, he must take it. He must. But if he doesn't want no, no, to... he doesn't know what he wants. It's up to us to, to lead him, to, to guide him. I don't know if I can interfere. No, not interfere. Not interfere. Help. Can you understand the potential of this mind, this man? Do you know what the world might lose if Horace were to remain in obscurity? No, no, you, you don't know. No one knows because it's all locked inside him. Like a cobalt bomb, it lies hidden there, ready to explode, ready to give the world great new knowledge. Facts are known to us now. Miss Blake, in all conscience, I tell you, our, our failure to help him now would be a tragic failure. Will you think about it, please? All right, I'll think about it. Thank you. Well, my five minutes are up. Miss 
Blake. My wife, Horace's mother, died when he was born. To the outside world, I must appear to be a lonely man, but I want you to understand that I am not trying to reclaim my son for personal reasons. I am not a selfish man, Miss Blake. I lost track of the time. Uh, well, what, what should we do? Go, go to a movie? Oh, Barton. What else is there to do? Just walk, maybe. There's something I want to talk to you about. We'll walk a little bit far. I talked to your father this afternoon. It was a coincidence, really, and he... Borden. Borden, please. Borden, please give me a chance to explain. Please. What a fool I've been. What a complete and absolute idiot. I trusted you, I believed in you. Just this afternoon I told you how safe I felt with you. Borden, I'm on your side. I believe in you. Now there's a position open in the physics department at Columbia. It would be so easy for you. Easy? It would be impossible. Well, you can't like working nights in a cafeteria. You can't like going to two, three movies a day just to lose yourself in some dream. You don't understand, do you? You say you understand, but you don't. Did you know that the army wouldn't take me because they felt I couldn't adjust? Adjust. Do you know how badly I wanted to go into the army, to put on a uniform, to be just a soldier, just a simple human being? But they wouldn't take me. Six years ago, I started living like this because I gave up. I just gave up. And this way, I don't have to prove anything. Yes, I was a teacher. At 19, I was an associate professor. And all that time, I had the feeling that everybody was looking and waiting, waiting, waiting. All right, prodigy, produce. All right, genius, produce. Produce the evidence that will prove Einstein is wrong. Produce the theory that will change the world. They were like children at my feet, waiting for me to hand them down the ABCs that would rock their very existence. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I can never do it because I don't know enough and I'll never know enough. There's so much. So very much to know and I could never know enough. But they expected me to make it up. They expected me in a fireless world to make fire in a wheelless world to invent the wheel. Explain the blue sky to a blind man who has never seen blue or a sky. That's what he did to me. I used to walk the halls of that university, afraid to face the people to whom I was becoming a failure. I hid behind the door of my office, hating the thought of seeing my students and the other members of the faculty to whom each day was another day of disappointment, another day in which I did not produce. And one day I said, enough. I will live where there are no mirrors. Well, I where I won't even have to face myself. I will live alone, where I will disappoint no one. It's simple, satisfying, and I'm happy this way. Happy? Yes, happy. You refuse to see that, don't you, Gerda? You refuse to accept what I am as an end. Your idea of happiness is like everyone else's, based on fairy tales and pots of gold at the end of Rainbow, or you walk off into sunset accompanied by sweet music. Well, I'll tell you what happiness is. It's the absence of pain. If I strive for anything, I strive for that. Not to be hurt. Not to experience pain. A vacuum. Even I know that nature pours a vacuum. Borden, please listen to me. Do you collect these pictures? and go to the movies just for something to do? Or is it possible that you feel somewhere in these pictures is the answer? And why do you keep these three books? Einstein, Freud, and the Bible? Why just these three?
they're a reminder to me that there is knowledge in the world. Truth. I read them trying to understand. Trying to find an answer? This first one, Einstein. The words are so simple, dealing with the physical world. But the other two... They're dealing with love. And that's the easiest, Borden. The easiest. What are you mumbling about? I said we've entertained some real flipolas in our time. You know, we've had some real lunatics to dinner. This is the first time we ever had an ex-child prodigy. Be quiet. Gerda might hear you. I want her to hear me. And you're on her side, so from now on I want to hear no more criticism about any of my friends. Even if I bring home a poet to dinner. Oh, no. I draw the line at poets. Unless they rhyme. Besides, he's kind of nice. Oh, you women, you know you're all alike. You're all alike. Betty, you give me a pain. It's like uh, when we first met, and you told me how crazy you were about my painting. You couldn't stand academic art. And then the minute we got married, you wanted me to paint like Thomas Hart Benton. Uh-uh, Orozco. <laughs> What's the difference? A lot of difference. They make money. Money? Oh, I beg your pardon, my darling husband. I keep forgetting you hate money. <laughs> I don't know, maybe she's got it in her mind to get him to go to an analyst. Look, if she could do that. Oh, an analyst. Now, that I would like to see. That really would be something. There's one analyst who in two weeks is going to be back with his analyst. Can I help? Yes, you can help Charlie finish setting the table. Okay, I can do it myself. Charlie, mm -hmm. please don't be angry at me. Well, I'm not angry. Now, this won't be the worst experience you've ever had. Just oh. be nice to him. Try to be understanding and tolerant. Oh, tolerant. You know, I hate that word. To be tolerant, you've got to tolerate people. It's another reason I left Iowa. My work was tolerated. Sometimes you forget just how lucky we had it in Iowa. You forget that we had a home and a family and that there was love and affection in that family. It seems our folks were just happy when we did something good, no matter what it was. No one ever pushed us, Charlie. No one ever tried us to make us into something we couldn't be. Yeah, all right. Are you trying to make Borden into something that he can't be? Now, look, just be careful how you manipulate. This is no stray cat you find in the woods and you feed and pet until it purrs. This is a man. Mm hmm Apparently, a lot of people before you have tried to turn Borden into something he isn't and failed. They didn't give him the one thing he really needed, the only thing that counts. They didn't love him, Charlie. Okay. Uh-uh. Mrs. Blake, am I late? Betty. No, you're not late. Come on in. Come in, Borden. Uh, hi, Borden. Oh. Well, this is very nice. Uh, make yourself comfortable, Borden. Can I get you a drink? I don't... Now, how about a beer? We got plenty, and it's cold. A beer? Yes, I'd like one, Charlie. Yeah, me too. Uh, Borden? All right. Good. Y yes, I'd like one very much. Charlie, I... I like this painting very much. Do? Aren't you going to ask me what it is? Uh, no, I, I I know what it is. I know what it is too. It's Times Square. It's seen from a rocket ship. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm you don't notice Arthur Borden. You know she just resents supporting me. That's all. I think it's interesting your breaking down light structure the way the Cubists used to break down physical objects. I think that's a natural step forward. Hey, Borden, you're going to have to come around more often. All right, you're ready for the, you're not even finished eating dinner yet. Oh, we'll be ready in the Betty, I'll do the dishes, don't worry. Oh, thank you. Well, aren't you coming with us? Oh, we're going to the reading of a new play where I'm up for a part. 
It's a great play, pretty far off Broadway, but what are you gonna do? It's called a garbage heap because that's where it all takes place. <laughs> what, inside a garbage heap? It's way out, symbolic, Gerta. It's the kind of thing you'd love. It's not what usually happens in an Iowa drive-in. You'd be surprised what happens in an Iowa drive-in. <laughs> Would you like to go, Borden? Uh, no. You're right, it's probably gonna be a drag. You know, even now, the whole idea bugs me. I'll be right with you. I want to apologize to you. Why? Why? Do I have to say why? Isn't it enough I want to apologize? I'm stupid. Look, sometimes when you're stupid, you, uh... Well, you're afraid of people who aren't stupid. You understand what I mean? I think I do. <laughs> Good, all right. Now you're coming to the reading? No, but thank you. All right. You'll be sorry. All right, all right. Well, we're a big smash, and the tickets are harder to get in South Pacific, uh, my fair lady. Don't bother to get down to your knees and beg. Just don't bother. <laughs> Come on, we won't even bother to say goodnight. <laughs> he apologized. I think for Willie to apologize is very difficult. I imagine it is. And I think he, he, he meant it. I'm sure he did. I feel good. It's amazing how good I feel. I, I almost didn't come for dinner. Why? Oh, I, I, I like your brother, Charlie, and, and, and Betty. Uh, and I think they like me, too. Certainly they do. I mean, I think they like me for myself, not just, just because you told them to. <laughs> Borden, Borden, what do people have to do? I don't know. I'm beginning to wonder if they have to do anything. This piano, this player piano, it's crazy. It, what would anyone do with a player piano in this day and age? Borden. No, but I mean, a player piano is... Well, Charlie likes it. He likes the sound of it. Isn't that enough? People do something or get something because they like it. My mother used to have a player piano. I remember it as a child. Of course, I never heard it because she died when I was born. And it was kept in a front room that was always closed. But I used to go in and look at things. <laughs> Uh, one day my father came in and said that I didn't belong in there. I mustn't go in there again because I didn't belong in my mother's room and I believed him. I believed everything my father said. To my father, I was a machine, a calculating machine. He fed in the data and the facts became correlated and registered and when you punch the right buttons, out came the correct answers. Simple. Not so simple. No, not really so simple. Because somewhere the cogs didn't mesh. He failed. But then my father always failed. He studied under Dewey and Freud, but he was never one of their brilliant students. And that was his failure, the ignominy of obscurity. Where did it fail? What happened to the machine? You read the books and they don't tell you. They don't tell you. They don't tell you why your mother died when you were born and why your father. You take a child and you have a theory. Like my father had a theory, a psychologist with the theory that the human brain, even at the moment of birth, is simply a receptacle for knowledge. Endless and bottomless. Put the theory to work. Learning, learning, learning. Knowledge, knowledge. No time to play. No time for affection. No time for love. A baby that is a sponge soaking up facts. Absorbing everything within sound and sight. 
and for a while it worked. But my father had forgotten one thing. He had forgotten the simple element of, of humanity. God, love, soul, I don't know. I, at the age of six, I knew what E equals MC squared meant, but I, I didn't know what I love you meant. And I still don't. That's the easiest, Borden. The easiest. How do I find it, Gerda? Gerda, how do I find it? You. It's a beginning. A beginning. Is that all? Borden, don't worry. No, but you said it's a beginning. Where is the end, Gerda? How do I find the end? Borden, it's not as simple no. as. No, Gerda, you said it has a beginning. Where is the end? How if do I find it? You'll just be sensible, be logical. Don't you understand? You'll see. Where is the end? How do I find it? You don't understand. All my life I've been expected to find the end, and I've never been able to find it. This is the United States Steel Hour. See now the march of the automobile, strong on steel for 62. local dealer now. There's only one thing better than steel in a new car. And that's you. We return to Act Three of Man on a Mountaintop from New York. Will you buy me a cup of coffee? Gordon, maybe 
maybe I was wrong about last night. Maybe it happened too fast for you, but is that my fault? I've tried to understand about you. Really, I have. Last night I read that book by Philip Wiley, and it frightened me because sometimes I can't separate the man you are from the man that you might be. Are you the man in Wiley's book? Must you be destroyed? I've given up. No, I won't believe that. You run from your father because he represents everything that frightens you, and you shout at me because you think I'm trying to push you the way he did. But how much can you hide? How deep can you dig? Your father will find you, Borden. He'll always find you. See him. No. See him just once and face the problem. No. Borden. Don't you see? He's just a man, a poor, bewildered man who doesn't understand what he's done. Tell him. I can't. Oh, Borden, don't you understand? No one's crucifying you. You're crucifying yourself. I can't. Making an awful lot of noise. That's all right. Well, uh, would you like to come and join us? No, thank you. Well, you're welcome, you know. I have to work soon. Well, the thing is, it's uh, kind of a, a party for Goethe. She's leaving. Leaving? I guess you haven't talked to her very much lately, have you? No, I haven't. Well, she's got another place up near Columbia. She and a couple of other girls. It's more convenient, you know. I guess she's had the village anyway. Charlie! Come on, we need some more ice. Yeah, okay, I'll go and get some. You're sure? No, thank you. Okay. Willie. Yeah? Willie, would you do me a favor? Here we go. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the entertainment for the evening. A real live genius, an honest to goodness prodigy, Horace Mann Borden. Now let's give him a little hand. <clears throat> Who's about to perform his famous act, last seen on the stage of Lowe's Lower Depths. An act known as the prodigy bit. Are you ready, Horace Mann? Now, boy, take a seat. Ably helped by that world famous Willie the Wonder Bliss. <laughs> prodigy. Give me the answer to the following question within three seconds. How much is 932 times 617? 575,044. How about that, huh? Let's give my hand. There's no need to check because the prodigy guarantees absolute accuracy and your money cheerfully refunded. <laughs> prodigy, William Shakespeare, Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 9. There are only seven scenes of the fourth act of Hamlet. <laughs> oh, no, you're a brilliant one. Uh, scene six, the words, please. Scene six, another part of the castle. Inner Horatio and servant. Horatio, who are they that would speak with me? Servant, seafaring men, they say they have letters for you. Let them come in. Exit servant. Horatio, I do not know from what part of the world I should be greeted, if not from Lord Hamlet. Exit Hamlet. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. We haven't finished the bit. <laughs> Isn't that it? Isn't that it? Isn't that the middle ground? You see, I can be the life of the party, too. What do you want, Gerda? What do you want? All right. I'll do anything you say. You tell me what to do. Max, you seem to be so nervous. Now, let me get you another cup of coffee. Oh, no, thank you, Wilson. Thank you, no. No, I am nervous. I feel this is the culmination of all the years. This is the moment when everything will be decided. Thank you for coming with me, Wilson. Maybe if the offer from the university comes from you directly as the head of the department, he'll feel more sympathy. Oh, Miss Blake. Dr. Borden? Well, where's Harris? You promised on the telephone. Well, he'd like to see you in his room, alone. 
This is Dr. Wilson, his old friend. Oh, this is the young lady I told you about. Wilson. How do you do? Hello. It's all right, Max. Just give him my best. Why shouldn't he want to see Dr. Wilson? Perhaps he's a little frightened, Dr. Borden. Frightened? No, that's not possible. Well, you know, Horace, he's never been afraid of anything in his life. Most kind, Miss Blake. Thank you. Now, perhaps if you'll be good enough to leave us alone together. I wanted to stay. But uh, I wanted to stay. She need not inhibit us. We know each other very well. Well, Horace, you wouldn't see Dr. Wilson. Wilson is not involved. Oh, but he is, Horace. He is. Well, he came prepared to make you a splendid offer. He wants to make you his departmental assistant. In five years, perhaps a full professorship. You'll have your own laboratory if you want one. You lecture, perhaps twice a week to graduate seminars. And the university press will publish any of your work that you care to make public such a splendid offer, Horace. You think it a splendid offer, Gerda? Of course it is. And that's, that's only the beginning. I don't want to talk but, about it. But uh, we'll not discuss it. It's a trifling offer, an unimportant offer. Whether I accept it or not is not the subject of the meeting here. But I thought that was precise. I want to ask you one question, then the meeting is over. Will you answer me one question? Horace, I did not come here to quarrel. One question. If I can. It's a simple question. It should be very simple for you to answer. My father, do you love me? I love you. I wish you'd go, please. No, I will not go. I will not go. What is this foolishness? I ask you a simple question. The simplest question in the world. Can you answer it? Can you search your mind and, and find one moment when you said, this is my son and I love him? Was it a moment in the hospital when I was born? Was it a moment as you stood over my crib? Was it a moment when I walked suddenly into a room? You look pain, Gerda. This is the moment you asked for. Now you want to run. Please stay in. The truth, Father. I want the truth. I... I loved you. I must have loved you. When? What was that moment? All right. Did you love my mother? Yes. Did you love her very much? Yes. Look at me, Father. Look at me. When I killed her by being born. Did you hate me for that? The truth, Father, I want the truth. Did you hate me for that? Is that why you did to me what you did? I did nothing to you. You only attained your full capabilities. I did nothing wrong. Nothing by wrong? You. Yours is the most marvelous mind of our time. And if for six years you have indulged you yourself... You have indulged I'm... yourself. No, I have waited for six years. I will wait for 20. I will wait a life... You have failed! You... you have failed. Look at me. I'm a freak. I'm a machine. I'm a machine built without love. Didn't you know that, Father? Didn't you know if you failed that I would be a freak? Didn't you know that? When you build a machine and it fails, you throw it away. What do you do with a man? What do you do with a man? I never thought of Now go on. I can't. Borden. Borden, you can. Don't 
think of yourself as a superman in a world that wants to crucify you. Don't destroy yourself. Come out of here. Come with me. But come out knowing that it's a beginning. I don't want to be destroyed. I want to live. Gerda. I want to come in. Funny thing about the places you go fishing, they're always off some old road that could double as an obstacle course. That's why the rough treatment parts of your car are made of steel, to give your car that extra strength that carries you safely over roads. It's great to know you can count on steel when the going gets rough. Knowing you can count on steel for wheels that will take it, for the strength the suspension has to have, for the ruggedness of bumpers that front for you and back you up. What else but steel takes you so far over such rough roads so often so safely? It all adds up to a feeling of confidence, knowing you've got steel to count on if the going gets tough. Here's a message from our alternate program. On November 22nd, be sure to see Track of an Unknown, the story of North American air defense, one week from tonight on the Armstrong Circle Theater.